There is a quite nice demo that you can try and play with. Uh, actually, you can do whatever you want to do. You can even run it. It's actually all running your browser. And it's on this address over here. And I, I, I'll show you something in a second. But basically, what you're doing is this problem here is to classify red and green dots. And it's in two dimensions. So basically, you will say, think about that as I mean, it could be both sequences of uh, two types, they have one another type, or, or uh, cancer, non cancer uh, uh, cells, and you have it with two measures, and they are sort of mixed up. And you want to figure out, like, uh, this region is uh, cancer, this region is not cancer, but you can imagine. It makes it two dimensions, so you can still visualize it. Uh, and this just shows you how. Uh, and then you have a network with not different number of hidden layers. So if you have only, and you see, if you have three hidden layers, you end up with something like that. So you see, there are one, two, three, four, one, four, and maybe two more wrongly classified. Green dots, the red dots, and one green dot is wrongly classified. If you have more hidden layers, you can get something just for better. You can extend out to this dimension here. You got four that are wrong instead of six. And if you actually have 20, you can get something that looks like that to classify like that. So basically, that's true. the more hidden layers, the more you feel more in charge, you can do better classification. <coughs> However, if you will put a new dot somewhere else, I mean, if it really is a function, it's a new example, and you put it there. Maybe it should, or, or, or you put it uh, here. Maybe it should be green, but it's actually this one because it's red. You really have to learn too much of the network. So we can. So, so there, there are two things here that are important. So this is. Basically, uh, so here, here you basically have um, so here you have some kind of network, and you can, for instance, t tell it to use uh, spiral data. You put the data in spiral, yeah. And you let the network learn. So you see, it can learn quite quickly. Not perfect, taking time to do it. But finally, you get to learn this. And uh, but if you want random data, which well, well, random data, you should not be able to learn because it's basically random. You can have to learn it enough to see. It. I mean, it does, it's hard to find things here, but it starts learning things with no patterns that are maybe not should not be there. So th 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 this, finally, you might even learn if I don't do this perfectly, but in that, uh, if I added more uh, layers, I might be able to do it better. Mm. Well, I, I, I could uh, add here, manage it with this computer and telephone, but I can basically go in here and add more hidden layers. Might be able to learn it better. It's faster than that. 
But it's also slower. Yeah, and also much slower. It might, it might be able to learn better, so later. My, my telephone is not the most powerful computer in the world, so you can't really worry about it. But, but in principle, uh, you, 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 when you play around with it, see what happens if you add more. In principle, you can learn anything if you have enough names, but it takes longer time. But to my point, it's not really that you should do this, but that you should. Mm, you should go back here. So basically, there is when you when you have put a lot of freedom to the network, more more variables, it will learn anything. But it also might not be might really be overfitted. So basically, it learns what the train to see. You can train train it, but if you want to have it as a learning something that is useful for the future, for some examples you have not seen yet, it might actually do worse. The same number of red dots, but instead yeah. of having like a U shape, I mean, it's just, certainly if it is, if they all the red dots were in one corner here, you could you can learn it, and you probably learn to, to uh, uh, and you could easily learn uh, just that part, and probably more lanes will learn it perfectly anyway. It wouldn't matter. But in this case, this is basically done on random pattern or more noise to pattern. You will learn a lot of noise that is not generally applicable for the problem. I mean, like in the third diagram, where yeah. there are many neurons. Yeah. So in there, like it's forming some kind of a shape, some particular kind of red pattern. Yeah. Does the pattern in which does, does the pattern really matter? Like if the same pattern is changed, like and instead of drawing that pattern, I can draw some different kind of pattern. Yeah. Is I mean, it it, no, it basically, yeah, the, the network would learn could learn another pattern. Yeah. I mean, it just happens to be this pattern that learned this case. It starts some random weights. You might have learned a pattern that it's, that it's, I mean, in theory, you could just learn one pattern that circulates these red dots, like you green and everything else. So it, it depends on the number of hidden names you have and what functions you can do. And, and there's also a randomness to it, because of course, you start from random weights. So it, this is just, so basically, the, pro, so basically the, the idea here is, basically what you should, is that if you give it too much freedom, it will learn something that's relevant. It is a classical example that you actually will learn what you see. So, like uh, the American military, long uh, time, time ago, tried to develop a neural network for looking at the taking tanks on uh, the battlefield. So they want to see, ah, oh, it's a tank here. We should be war. So you could have thought about having it like mm -hmm. a, as on the border control. So in the war zone, where you have things like that. So they went went out and took out pictures of of uh, possible battlefields with tanks and without tanks. The network learned it perfectly. They were fantastic. Then they went out again to look, take some new pictures. Try again. And it was completely useless. And afterwards, they realized that all the pictures with the tanks were taken on a sunny day, and all the pictures without tanks were taken on a cloudy day. So the network was very good at taking sun and cloudy, but had nothing to do with tanks. So it, really, it learns what it sees, but it, don't really, um, it doesn't have to be representative. So you have to, also, what you have to do is you have to take some kind of uh, uh, test set that is completely independent and test the performance of that. Yes, uh, yeah, this is the classic example. So often what you do is you have a test set and train set. We'll come back to some variation of that later. Uh, so basically, this is the number of training runs, so basically the number of times you run your back propagation. And the red is the training set, and the Green is the test set. So this is basically you, you take your data, you divide it into two halves, and then they're not related to each other. And you see here in the beginning, the first like 20 iterations, you really they are basically follow each other. The training set gets much better, you get much this is the error, you get much better performance here, but also on the test set some like it was. But then after a while, this one levels up, it even starts going up at the end. So even if you're worse performance, you basically here you learn that are specialized features that are just such as the test but are not generally applicable for your problem. So basically, you get overtraining for performance. Uh, overtraining. 
So th this is a classical problem in, 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 in many fields. And there are, nowadays there are good tricks for avoiding it, but not everybody does. So one, one of these commands. The classical trick is basically you did this and you said, oh, hey, I can stop here because I of that my training te my test itself is not going to better. What is the X and Y? So X is the number of training rounds, basically the number of how long time I keep on training it. And Y is the error, meaning some measure of error. So this is the one, the, the y number here, the errors, this is whatever error function you use, 25% wrong or 15% or wrong. So how many of, of, the, of the, your, your examples are classified wrong? Yeah, but you have to mine. So, so one is the training data, okay. and this is the test data. So this is what you, you what you, so you can, you can think about it like in this problem over here. So this, if, you, if you have like two pictures, which, which they should have the same kind of pattern, but you show them the two, what? Well, this is the one that you have. You, can take, you take half the dots, and you have a training, and you should print the other half. So you have to take away half of it randomly, and you start the training, and you, take out, and you keep the other half to test it. And if you do that, you will not get the same performance on the test. So while, or if this had a network, probably would not be very good because you would learn some other features that are not part of producing. And, but the trick to use nowadays is what I'm called regularization, which basically makes these sort of curves more small, so you don't learn things that are very much like that, instead of learn things that are smaller. So it's a fact that you can play around with. But the classical way was basically, you had a complete inside test that you, that, you, that you tested on, and you stopped training when you perform a decrease on that test. Uh, okay, this is now basically um, I go on to the next paper, this one, ten rules, and what, what, and I as the time follow them, the rules I have to write them in the paper, and I think the rule one was optimize your hyperparameters. So basically, this is another type of algorithm, but basically you can say, I mean, do I want to take into account? Small things like close to my or a bigger area or in a bigger area or in a bigger area. Depending on the classification. So basically, in the neural network, the hyperparameters are the number of hidden lawyers and how they're connected and what type of architecture you have. So, this is something that you that is difficult for you cannot train the network to do that, but you need to optimize that and try different uh, sets of parameters. And often, you need for that, also you need an independent validation set to test the places. Uh, so, need, so basically, I think I did, yes. This is maybe I should start with this one. So often nowadays, what is recommended is that if you have your data, so in this case it would be the red and blue, green dot and last one. You have a training set and a test set. Or, or a validation set. When you, you train here, then that is this, and then you validate your performance on, on this set. But then you keep a test set that's completely independent. And, and, and it's basically using, the training set is used for optimizing the network. The validation set you use to optimize uh, the architecture. So like you, how many hidden layers you have, etc. Like so you, you always validate it on the validation set, basically, but you need, but yeah, there's also something optimized. And then you can do completely independent tests and you just test on the end when you want to compare with other methods. So we're back up to this one again. So you train your model on the training set, you save it of course, and you evaluate it on the validation set, so basically how good is it in this, so basically that's, that's what was the red line in last, or in last, the green line on there. Uh, in lots of size. Uh, and then you keep on doing that until you're done. And you calculate some kind of match, I'll talk about it in a second. In this case, I recommend a match to correlation coefficients. And then you keep on doing this. And then you say the best, the one thing I can get uh, best uh, parameters here. 
and uh, you apply it to the test set. Often, you don't have an independent training and, and validation set. Often, instead, what you do is you do what is called cross validation. So, you basically, actually make, for instance, three predictors and use two thirds of the data to test on the third one. And you do it three times. Of course, it takes three times longer, but that's my. If you have a lot of data, you don't need to do it. But if you have a limited amount of data, you want to use as much as possible the data. You can do this in three times, five times, or ten times. Because it depends, of course, how much data you have. If you have enough data, you don't need to reason. But if you want to use all your data, you do it like that. But of course, it takes a longer time to read the string three times. They, they, they are the same architecture, but of course, during training, all the weights will be different. So I will get different weights. So I, I will get uh, th three different in independent predictors at the end. So often what you do at the end is you actually you either start doing another training and everything again, or, or you use all three and then you take the average of them and that one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you saw it, well, yeah. except for maybe some random values, but you have the same number of hidden layers, and that's the that's you keep the same. Uh, so basically, yeah, we, we want to uh, avoid overfitting. And, and, and in biology and sequence data, we often want to uh, rem remove homology because you can learn that the proteins are similar. I mean, if you want to predict secondary structure, <laughs> And you know that this protein has the secondary structure, you can learn it. But that doesn't mean that it's a good secondary structure predictor in general. So you want to remove homology. Uh, another problem here that they discuss, is basically that often in, the, in mathematics, we have very unbalanced data sets. So if you think about uh, cancer mutations, of course, most mutations do not cause cancer, but one in whatever, million, thousand, ten thousand, do just you have a very, very few of one type of either positive or negative example. So that means that if you, well, if you well, yeah, sort of me measure performance in the percentage correct predictions, for instance, so in this case, if you said everything was negative, you have 90% correct, which is pretty good. That is not, maybe not a good measure of use. And we'll come back to that, I guess, in the next slide, maybe? Well, not in so on, at least so on. So, these are some basic ideas that you want to have a training data, your data. I mean, it's important. Actually, a lot of the work often in, 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 in machine learning project mathematics is to get a good training set. It's actually, of course, biological experiments are noisy, and uh, you want to have the high quality ones, and you want to have a lot of them, so it's, it's always a balance. And sometimes many people have done predictors on predictors. You, you go to Unipod, you know Unipod, and you say, I want to predict all the single peptides. And you go to Unipod and extract all the single peptides. You write small program to do that. And you make the predictor of this. But then you realize that actually most of the data in Unipod are from another predictor. So you're just going to predict what another predictor does. And it doesn't really provide any new value. You might be, a, be as good as that one is, but not better. So you need to have think where your data comes from and how good it is. Uh, there is a pro often an advantage of having a roughly equally balanced data. There are ways to look at around it, but they are often generally get better performance if you try to get a good balance. And of course, most importantly is that the training set should represent what you want to use for the future. So you should, uh, you should not use completely different set of organisms or completely different set of sequences because that's not how you want to, that's not what you use it for later. And then when we evaluate performance, we can always think about uh, this is also in the book. And uh, how, how how we talk about this a bit rough than Monday. Uh, you can divide your data set you can think about it as anything, as, as, a, as, a, as a state data. I mean, this happens to be seen, but it's really, really the data. And, but this thing will be ever as you have something you want to predict, which is the positive set, and something you want to predict 
uh, not to be really interesting. This is basically things you say that this should, should not be yin, this should be yin, this should be yin. You think about it as positions or entries or whatever, it doesn't really matter. And then you have this that the true positive, you know, that's the part that you predict that is correct. Or the, or the positive set, and the same thing as the two negatives is the positive part that you correct from the negative set. So basically, these are the ones cancer causing mutations that you predict to be cancer causing, and the ones that are not that you predict those. This is the correct predictions. Uh, and then you have the wrong predictions, either because you predicted it to be positive, predicted it to be, to be cancer causing, but it's not, or it was cancer causing, but you predicted it not be. So you have the false negatives and the false positives. Uh, and you have these measures of sensitivity and sensitivity. The sensitivity is the true positive divided by uh, the true positive plus two neg false negatives, basically. How many of the things you should find did you find? And the specificity is basically how many of the things you found, uh, how many of the things that you uh, found, uh, and how many of the things you, you no, no, sorry. Sensitivity is how many of the things you found that are correct. And specificity is how many of the things that you should find you did you really find. And then the correlation coefficient, or well, let's say people often use what's called matrix correlation coefficient, which is the. Uh, yeah. I forgot that paper, but that's. Uh, and you're going to take the accuracy of course, that is also matched. That basically how many things are correct for everything. Uh, how many, how about, but then probably the accuracy is that if it's 99% of everything should be one class, easy thing to get 99% accuracy is to pick everything to be one class. But that, was, that, that has no information, it depends on there's no value. Uh, you have the F1 score, which is basically the uh, average of the uh, sensitivity and specificity. It's not sensitivity, but sensitivity. Uh, yeah, sensitivity. So a, but often a good measure, I think the best is what's called matrix correlation coefficient. So that's basically a measure. I don't write the formula, but it's basically measure that goes from minus one to plus one. Zero will be random. And it depends on the, uh, and one will be a perfect prediction, and minus one will be a completely incorrect prediction. Everything is absolutely opposite, which of course you have to turn around and make it perfect. But, uh, so if you have less than zero, you are doing worse than random. So, and uh, so that's a very useful measure for unbalanced Data set. And it basically, it, it, it's not really linear. So if you have, if you have 0 0.3, 0 0.4, that's really quite a good value. But if you have 0 0.6, 7, 8, you get quite good values. So if you want to have one number which matches, that's probably the number you should use. And then you can plot the sensitivity and specificity. Basically, but all these things that you have here are, of course, sort of dependent on the value. You can basically say you have a cutoff here that we define this is for correct, this is not correct. You have what we have predictions are often between zero and one, a number, it's not just zero and one, it's a number, so you make a cutoff, and then you can predict you know, a rock curve that goes from uh, recall version fallout, which is basically uh, a curve that is looked at, a perfect curve that looks at this, or a precision recall curve that looks at that. It's basically a Slight variation of the same thing. Sometimes then it really depends on what area you're interested in, the high specificity or high sensitivity, what is the best. And often a good, a good measure is measure the area under this curve, which you have a look. But you can see basically a method that is better in, uh, up, up here or in that corner are better than another method. Sometimes there is an advantage to doing do this in dog scale as well. Okay. So, so far we talked a bit about measures, we talked a bit about machine learning. So what, what do you do in science math? How, how do you represent the sequence? Because the sequence is not numbers. So often what we want to do in, in mathematics, at least in the more structure of what we think about here, is that we have Sequence. So 
Do we have a sequence? A, C, D, E, F. Or a DNA approved sequence. And if you want to classify this sequence, so maybe we well, belong to some group A or some group B, or more often you want to say that this residue here belongs to some category X. So you would say, is this a binding site, or is this a, a surface area site, or is this a helix or something like that? So it's also, or is a signal cap site. So how can you do this? Because my networks do not take on ABCs. Of course, I could take ASCII code and listen to the universe as a number, but that's probably not the most useful. Uh, networks like to have zero values um, between zero and one. And of course, a problem here so is that you, you couldn't think when you have a calculation you do something like this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four, this is five, etc. That's one way to represent it. However, that means that my weights for this thing will be twice as high as the element. Which may be not really, may make it be complicated because I need to have, that that's maybe not really what I want to do. So, what I do often is what's called sparse encoding. So, I have a 20 amino acid vector here, or 20 amino acid, 20 position vectors. So, I have position 1, 2, 3, 4, so and I have 1, and I have 0, 0, 0, 0. And the system I have zero, like that, and so like that, so I have this. Etc. Basically, I have a one, so I have 19 zeros and the one one. Because that's so basically my input length. If I have an input of 10 residues, I will have 200 numbers that would be 180 of these would be zeros and 20 would be ones. But that's what's called sparse encoding. So that's one, one way to do it. Uh, so, if I have MASL, I will have this long input here. So, input will be quite long. A good thing about that, 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 is, that is actually, if you, if you would think it would have a multiple sequence line and stuff, I could just take the frequencies of each of my acid and replace them. I have basically the same thing. And until I only find numbers, a little bit more data, I started out, instead of 0 and 1, I have something between 0 and 1. There are other ways you could do it. You could, for instance, map this to some physical chemical properties. Obviously, you need six dimensions of how to do it. You want to have charge, polarity, size, something like that. Uh, you can group the amino acids that are more similar to each other into fewer groups. But in principle, I think the most common is clearly your sparse coding. So, yeah, I got it. Yeah. So another problem, so if I really had a problem, I would start by A and B, so basically what I would have, I have then. I have a question. Yes? Oh, sorry, for the last question, um, the order is what makes it different for each of the last because you have one, and then 19 zeros, and then zero, one, and yeah. then. So, 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 so A would be one, 90 zeros, 16 would be zero, one, 80 zeros. Okay. So I mean, it, it's just, this is a vector, so there you go. Uh, so, if I had this problem of A and B here, and I want to tell, tell the proteins class A and class B. And if, if I have two proteins then, and they're different amino acids, of course. Say that this is 100 amino acids long, so I have 100 times 10, so 2,000 inputs. If this protein then is 101 amino acids long, should I, how should I represent that? Or if it's 200 as usual. Because then the, then the input vector will be different lengths. And that's not really what I, I mean, I, I could of course decide I'm going to take the first 100 residues, or I take the last 100 residues, or something like that. But if, if there's a motif, say, say for instance, the classical, I want to do signal, uh, um, yeah, predicting alpha helices, it can be anywhere in the sequence. So how do I figure out what is an alpha helix? 
So one way to do it, which is quite common, well, it used to be not quite common, is that I take a window. So I say the alpha helices are only, the only important information are the things that are close in sequence to the, to the position. So I take a window here, and I ask, what is, is this position in the middle? Is it an alpha helix or not? <coughs> or a beta sheet or a mu. And I have a window here, and often typically sites like 19 sites, often it's an odd number, so it has a sequence size this size. It doesn't have to be, but often it makes more sense. So then I, and then I have a slide, and then I do this, and then I move this one step to the right, or one step, and ask, is this position an alpha helix or not? So I have what they call a sliding window. So I take one position at a time. I have to do some special tricks at the end so that people do differently. differently. Except for that, you can basically go through the whole sequence from the beginning to the end and have the same size all the time. And that works quite well for any problem that does not include long range information. So if the alpha helices is dependent on uh, things that are more than 10 transfers away, then I can do that information, but to a large extent it's not. There are the, the trick that people do, no, 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 I come to that mainly in the next week or in the, in the next time, but we look, if you could do this in two dimensions, you can really have one dimension here, and you can look at the window like that. But that's, that's a bit special case I talked about in, in, at the end. So basically, if you have window size of seven, you start with M, A, S, L, B, L. The next one is F, A, S, L, B, L, third year, and you will keep on doing that. This can be secret. Uh, so, okay, well, you, so you get lo lots of different things. But the good, the good thing about it is actually you get many more training examples. So instead of having one training example for each sequence, you have hundreds. We have one for each So it increases the amount of chain data, which is good because you want to have a lot of chain data. I have a question. Yes. But as a concept, would it be also possible, I mean, it is of course more to calculate, but would it be possible to, instead of having these number codes, to um, to put the, the letter and the, then uh, attach a file as an input, as an input document where physical parameters are described so that the machine learning is calculating through the, uh, through with the amino acid as a variable referring to a list of values. Yeah, in and principle, yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. In principle, you can be whatever you want. So what this has or, many people use is basically some kind of physical chemical parameters. Yes, yes. So often you can use size, charge, so basically, yeah, yeah. And, 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 um, but I mean, often that, that, that you actually only need like five, six numbers. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, would, I would just put it as an extra file. Okay. Yeah, you can, you can both, list, but yeah. it's in principle, it doesn't add an equation. Because if you have these 20 vectors, you could actually make a network to learn that, okay. ideally. But, but, but in other cases, we learn faster. That is really important information. Yeah, it's easy to use. But in most cases, you don't, don't use it anymore. Okay. Yeah. In our case, we've used it, but it, it doesn't really provide a lot of extra value. Okay, okay. Okay, so now I was going think about explaining an example and that sort of tells you a bit of a history of a problem and also a bit that demonstrates you know, how the field has, has advanced in the last uh, uh, well, 20 years almost I guess. So the problem here is what I talked about before is basically a signal peptide problem. So yes, it's a biology. You have a cell and a translation protein and you have an N-terminal signal peptide or transition, pe transition peptide. And that one actually can decide, and you know, if this is a plant, and you go to a chloroplast mitochondria, secretory pathways, you basically go to the ER Golgi and be secreted or into the membrane, uh, plasma membrane, or anything else. So you basically, the question we want to answer is, is this protein being in ER Golgi, mitochondria, chloroplast, or anywhere else? Anything else could be a nucleus or peroxisomes, um, um, whatever. Like, like and we know from biology that this is governed by an N terminal peptide that is cleaved away. 
Mm. So we, this is my colleague Olof. Who basically has a pre-sequence here in the proton receiver side here, and he developed this pair of actually three different predictors here: one for single peptides, for the EGFC feature, one for mitochondrial target peptides, and one for four plus target peptides. Uh, so, how did he do this? And this is, I don't know, 20 years ago, but it's, I think 15 years ago. So we know first, we know some biology, so we know what to look for. So we start with basically the database of verified, experimentally verified targeting peptides. So you go to SwissProt, you look for it, and you just take only ones that have experimental evidence. And actually, at the beginning, he went through all the papers because there are enough errors in the database for making, making problems. So people put in the wrong thing or the experiment doesn't really, I mean, some, some, someone has read a paper and they didn't, didn't understand it or the experiment is unclear and so on. So uh, they are, it's not the most trusted evidence in the space. But it was already known that uh, you have some kind of rules here. And here you have an R minus 10, R minus 3, R minus 2. So basically, in position 2, 3, and 10 from the cleavage size, this will use be a lot of ordinates. And here you have it in the chloroplast, and actually here you have an sort of alanine in the cleavage. So this is such. This is in position minus one, minus two. I think it is like minus one, minus three. And but, it, but it's not hundred percent. It can be an isolution of alien also. And like that. So there are some things that was known that people figure out and started to learn about about it before. But and you, you did the sequence logos, I guess, in some lab. Did you? No, you okay, so that so sequence logo is just a way to represent the multiple sequence alignment. So from a multiple sequence alignment, you can basically calculate the Shannon entropy, so the information that's contained in each position. So each of these uh, columns are a position in a multiple sequence alignment. And then the height of the whole column is basically how much information, so basically it how, how conservative the position. The more conservative, the higher it is. And it's measured in bits, so actually 4 is 100 conserved, and yeah, 0 is new information, basically means that all amino acids are things completely random, they are equally distributed. And uh, then this coloring here, is, then basically the height of each letter is the height, the fraction of uh, that that letter has in this position. So here it's about half of it is alanine, and half is something else. So you can see for the single path that you have, and then the calling is that uh, I guess that uh, blue and red are polar negative, and uh, re uh, green is polar, and uh, black is hydrophobic amino acids. So here you see they have this alanine in position minus one and minus three. You can see that minus one is almost also alanine. And you have a region here before that is uh, mainly hydrophobic amino acids. And these are all aligned at the cleavage side, not aligned with the enter, but aligned at the cleavage side. And here you can see this R, R genes minus two, minus three position. And here you can see alanine, alanine, valine in the position of minus one, minus three, and minus, minus one, minus two, minus four. And you even have this R gene minus 10 there. And it's like nicely starting here, R gene. But anyhow, these are quite complex paths that you want to learn. You can see there are more information in this one, so it should be easier to learn that than the other ones. But also the data might be like noisy and so on, but it's not something you want to learn. But it's some information, everything is long, and it, but it's spread out with window. So you basically have yeah, lots of different information. You have, you have different regions and every cleaver side and so on, so you try to predict it. So what Olaf did was first to create a data set. So he ran the Swiss plot and ran through all the annotated single peptides and four plus and mitochondrial peptides. He checked all the literature manually, and then he did what we what he called homology reduction. Basically, removed all data sets or data points that are too similar. So I think he used 20% cleavage identity. So basically, if two cl classes are more than 20% identical, he just kept one of them. So uh, that meant from starting from a few thousand data points here, they went down to less than half. So they had like 140 chloroplast target peptides, and uh, 152 others, and so 300 of uh, the other ones. And in the non-plant stand, it had to be more. Or the non-plant chloroplast. 
and often you know if you brought in plans or not the plan program and stuff because you can train different things. Mm, yeah, we can find a better solve this one. So basically, I just took the sequence and did this what we call it sparse encoding and said any position here at the beginning that is a part of a particular sensor peptide is that it's a one and the answer is a zero. So then he tried, then it's predicted that there are three independent networks, as you can see here, it's like this path. But then it's like a chloroplast peptide, uh, a single peptide, so basically, this is the output of the network. So like this one has basically output of one, or close to one, all the way up to position 60, and that's here. So this is maybe what it should be. This one has some noise output here and there, and other noise output, but nothing like clear. So he did, so basically he trained, so in this case, maybe this should be an explorer pattern, but he provided all these thousands of data points to it and trained uh, three different predictors. One for that, one for one for one for one And he didn't train it only for, so he trained actually for each of these, he trained, and the optimization is this, every single position in the peptide, which is like 30, 40 positions, is a positive sample and everything else is a, is a negative sample. I think you only use the first 100 residues because of that, you know, I mean, it's just the protein stuff, you don't ignore that. So basically, he learned it is a part of his record. And in, in the other studies, it was used based on the cleavage size, so like they had a special network for treating cleavage size. So he did not use that in this case. So he, he then the, the network basically gets a prediction for each position of the first 100 amino acids in each of these three network predictions. <coughs> so basically you have 300 predicted numbers. So n number of percent of probability that that residue is in, uh, in, in a certain, pattern, uh, certain single pattern. And then they had a network to take all these 300 numbers and predicted, just had an output, is it n of these four classes? Is it chloroplast, uh, mitochondria, a single peptide, or any other localization? So he did this two layers of network training. And that, that was often used, you also used these two layers of things for a long time until, what, until very recently, because that was the way of training one step at a time. I, I didn't really understand what the integrating network, so the first, so, um, the first layer is um, different. Um, so so what's the second? So basically the first, the first layer, Show here. So here you have the first hundred residues, mm -hmm. and assuming that this is a chloroplast, so you have basically mitochondrial and the single peptide. So the, assuming that it's chloroplast, then it looks like that the input. Because all these positions, it has a chloroplast peptide here, mm -hmm. and then you stop. And then, but, but then for mitochondria, the, the input is zero, 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 and for single peptide, this is zero, 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 zero. So this, this is for training. So. So then, when you predict, you make a train three different networks. So you train, train one for chloroplast, one for mitochondria, and one for single peptides. And each of these will predict some number from position zero to 100. You predict something, if it's a good network, you will predict perfect like that, but if you want to be perfect, you maybe predict something like this. The mitochondria should predict zero or else, but of course, if you lose some noise, you will predict something like that. And the signal peptide is pretty something or something like that. And then you basically, basically here now again you have 100 numbers here, 100 numbers here, and then you have 300 numbers. So you have this vector 300, and you have a new network. You take all these 300 numbers and you predict basically three outputs, or four outputs actually. It's six color pass, mitochondria, signal peptide, and numbers. So you basically take four out and you take the one, and then uh, well, I think that's the next one actually, if you. Mm. And so this is the output. The output here is basically probability that this amino acid, uh, this protein is chloroplast, mitochondria, phenopeptide, or other. This one is clearly mitochondria. That's the six. And then you have, so you basically you take the highest numbers up. And this one is that it's a chloroplast. This one is a single peptide, and this one is a single peptide, and this is uh, And then you even, depending on the strength here, yeah, you have some kind of reliability score, so it's different between that one and the next one. So here, the reliability is quite strong, which is 97.5, but 
and then the second highest is point one. But here it's point five to point twenty seven, so it's not such a big difference, but they have a lower Leibniz order. And I extend have a second natural order pretty quickly besides this, but that's that's the second order that's okay. Uh, I'm really sorry, but can you go back to the slide with the um, probabilities for uh, each amino acid to... The first one? No, no. Way back. Oh, and the... Yeah, this, this one. Yes. Like, in, in the graph, the, the size of the letters is not directly proportional to the probabilities. The, the, the height of the whole column yeah. is uh, decided by the... Uh, the information in that column. So basically, the well, formula is the Shannon entropy. But, but it's basically, it, 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 the more conserved it is, the higher it is. The more conserved it is, then you have more information. Basically, that if your position is perfect, it's conserved, you have more information. It's like, well, in terms of dynamics, if you have everything that's. Uh, okay. uh, so the, the basic, basically, you're thinking about it like inverse co conservation. That's the height of the whole column. But then, then this height is then divided according to the frequencies of the amino acids. So uh, that this alanine here is bigger than that alanine doesn't mean necessarily there are more alanines there. It's just, well, it probably does, but, but, but uh, mm, it just mean, it, it, if it was, uh, it, it means that uh, some alanine here can still be quite frequent, but information is very low. But it's but it, it, it's it's really had a yeah. So, so, so it really tells so the, the, there are two different things. One is the relative size of each letter, and one is the size of the whole column. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's 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 a very useful tool to uh, I mean it's just visualization. But it's very useful for finding patterns. And this one this is not that clear, but this is very clear. You really see what you have there. So this is the output basically. And now we have just we are just on the way to update target P target P 2.0, and uh, we use it in this architecture. So you can see maybe this is sort of I, I'm not going to go through it all, but it, it basically you see that we have really uh, went all right, the network are much more complicated. So this is just one network basically. But here is basically the input is the same thing, but basically you look at the 200 plus residues. And then we have a layer that basically recode the network, that basically tries to represent like the blossom sequences. And then we have networks that instead of going just feed forward, they actually go up and down along the sequence. So basically a lot of connections for position one, position two, and they are actually quite deep also. So they really have boxes on that nodes connect to each other. And then basically we, more, we do it from, from the right and to the left, and we actually put them together again. And then we have uh, what's called a tension layer that basically tries to focus certain areas here. And then we have uh, uh, something that actually just brings the little size. And this one is good for the cat reason. This is just something that can be the size. And this is all trained in one. So it's not like several layer numbers. And really, this is what happened uh, the last five, ten years. Oh, well, not ten years. Well, maybe ten years. Well. Is that you can now train this complex network, and this is mainly spelled function and some other tricks at the advantage of this GPU programming. So you actually can train these things, and it's actually not even very slow. You can train overnight on one, on one graphics card. But of course, you have to play around, and we don't know if this is the best network yet, so it takes some time to do it. But it's really the advantage, the advances of machine learning has really, and we learn how to do these things, and we learn how to not overtrain it. A lot of tricks that, that people are learning these. So it's really, and most of it has come from image recognition or speech recognition or uh, text encoding and so on. So that's really what it feels from. We just do really use whatever, whatever on there. And this is almost the same problem with the just the same way. This is actually for taking subcellular localization. This is not our work, it's from the same people that we collaborate with that um, have a, a similar, see, they really have. Uh, here they have these ne networks that go from different ways, so they have different size of them, and they have uh, several layers here in four different blocks of layers, and they have something called a tension layer that basically focuses on some areas of this. 
and then they have a prediction that it's basically the world is telling to be if it's literally every each side to uh, each subset of localization. So it's side plasma plus D, the first form or D or etc. Because D block this. And you can see here this is improvement in gains. This is in just a single peptide. We go, this is the predictor recall curve. So this is what we do now. This is what we use for one one. So the improvements are quite big. And this is for the mitochondrial. This is solid T1. This is solid T2. And these are some other methods that I've been doing. But um, well, there are, this one is also good. But that can't do it for the things we do. Uh, this is something I will talk about next week, or maybe it's one week more week. It's basically structure predictions. So this is, unfortunately, in our field we get competition by Google. So this is Google. They call it Alpha Code. So you, you, you might have heard that Google has a, uh, Google bought a company in London called DeepMind that has been uh, winning in chess and in Go against the best humans in the world. So in the beginning, I mean, chess is maybe the most interesting part of it. Like, I mean, it was 20 years ago or 15 years ago that IBM made this computer called Watson that beat the best chess player in the world. But that is, chess is a very quite simple game. If you, have you can if you have a good calculator, you can calculate all possible moves and you can calculate if you're doing better well. And of course, computers are very good at calculating. So they learn that. But, but the difference is now that these people do not learn things. They really just uh, do. Uh, they take a chessboard, and they have, you know where all the are 64 by 64 bits, and you know where all the different uh, boards are, and you should say, what is next move I should make? So you learn that, basically, uh, and. Uh, and um, this is not that you tell it to calculate things in the future, not what we basically, and, you, and their latest thing they published is, uh, it, it was Alpha Sigma, I think it's called, uh, they basically let a computer play it against, against itself. They basically only learn the rules about chess, nothing else. You don't put in anything else, let it play against itself many, many times. In four hours, it's better than anything else on the planet. Better than any other computer program, better than any other. Uh, Human player and a, and a human player with combination of any computation I have to have. It takes four hours to learn. So now the problem is like, of course, in chess competitions nowadays, there are still humans playing chess. All the way out there, good at it. So, how do you know that the humans are cheating? I don't know how to spot earpieces here, uh, have a small telephone that actually tells them what to do. So, what, is this, what you do then is basically you look, the, 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 the judges, the referees, they check for unusual moves, moves, things that are not really common that people haven't played before. But basically, you, the computer is much more creative in finding new things that we haven't thought about before than we are. The, the traditional computer games were, computers were not. So you have to learn the rules, basically you have to repeat what we did, but not make, a, not, not make a mistake. But real one, they find things that we would never think about. Because if you know that three steps further or five steps further, I will have an advantage that we can't think about. So really, really if you're too creative, the referee will think that you're a computer. And Go is another of these games that is much harder for computer to calculate because the possibilities are much harder. And, they learn the same thing as putting the rules and they learn as well. I think there's still a few games that we can win in. There are some of these advanced computer games where you need to communicate with people in a star class and other things you can still win, but it's, it's getting a bit closer. Over. So they actually answered that the protein structure competition contest that I've been working on for many years. And this is the other results. So they're basically, one of them is the correct structure, one is their model. And they are pretty good, I would say. It's not perfect, but they are pretty good. And this is basically the trick here I'm talking about later. Is basically, they have the sequence and they predict the contact maps, or they predict the distance, and they predict how far away is each resident from each other. And this is, uh, I guess, this is the real data, and this is the pre data, or the other way around. They look very similar. And then they have a small program that unfolds it. 
this, so this is something I will talk about a bit in two weeks or next week, whenever it is. <laughs> Sorry, I'm late. So we should stop. Right, we have, I think we have time for discussion now. Do you need a break first or, or for, the, for a question for the exam or something?